talk a little bit today about um, World Health Day campaign that we did last year around urban health and how that relates to um, the, uh, the built environment, physical activity, and partnerships. So a little bit about uh, my background on that. Um, I work for the World Health Organization in Kobe, Japan, as our Center for Health Development. Uh, there we focus on urban innovation and health research issues. Uh, so um, we're part of the headquarters overall, but we were asked in the work that we do, we were asked by the organization to spearhead the campaign on World Health Day um, because the topic was urban health. So just very quickly, a little bit about World Health Day. Um, it's celebrated every year on April 7th, um, and that's the birth of the WHO of our organization. And what's probably more important than that is it's the one time of the year where the entire organization focuses on one health issue. And I'll explain a little bit uh, later why this is actually very important and how we um, can leverage the resources of the organization and our partners to focus on creating more visibility and also giving out some key messages on certain health priorities. So just uh, a little bit about World Health Day 2010. Um, the theme overall was Urban Health Matters. And WHO is a technical organization. So all of our messaging needs to be evidence-based um, and in line with that to have sort of advocacy around that so that the messages get out there. And here we developed with our partners and the rest of the organization five calls to action. And we'd really like to, to focus a lot on the first few in terms of promote urban planning for healthy behaviors and safety, improve urban living conditions, and so on. Um, what that is about. But this conference is about think global, move local, and this is really pertinent to what the campaign was. We were thinking, okay, we have these calls to action, but how can we get much more uptake globally and getting people to literally move on this day and throughout the year to highlight some of the really good initiatives that were happening um, in terms of what we knew were happening in countries and with our partners. So we designed a campaign called A Thousand Cities, A Thousand Lives. And it was a way for us to have a global target to leverage all of our offices in WHO and our partners um, and the activities to focus on opening streets. So it was an invitation to open streets on April 7th or thereabouts um, and to have some kind of health promotion activity. So this could be biking or walking or even creating green space. It was a wide range of issues, but really focusing on getting people to move on that day and when possible to make it sustainable. Um, for future efforts. We're really happy. A thousand cities in the time I can say it's, it's pretty hard to push through the organization. We're never going to get a thousand cities. It's so difficult. It's going to be impossible. But I'm really happy to say that we actually reached and went beyond that. 1,500 cities participated on that day. So I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, how this came about and the origin of it. We had a lot of time to plan for the activities. We were approached by our director general. Um, in 2008 saying, okay, we're going to have this topic in two years. So we worked extensively with partners in terms of the planning around the campaign. And we had, at conferences like this, we had lots of side sessions with partners. What would help you further your message? What can we do together? And I just wanted to share some of the thoughts in those discussions that really hit me hard in terms of how we really um, can move a lot in terms of the built environment and physical activity. So at one of the presentations, somebody asked the question, has physical activity been systematically designed out of our environments? And if you think about it, outside, inside, and at play, the healthy choices aren't the easy choices. They're not necessarily always relevant there in terms of our design of built environment. So what can we do about this? I'd like to introduce this, this is a, it's something called choice architecture. And this is a term that was coined by um, some academics who wrote a book called Budge. Um, it was Cass Simpson and uh, Richard Thaler. And in it, they describe that choice architecture is about how um, decisions are influenced by how we present certain choices. So in the book, they give examples of a child in the cafeteria and where food is placed. So if you put the cakes and the pies and all of that closer to the cash register at a high level, it's easier to grab as you're going to the cash register. But sure enough, when you replace that with fruit and made that more accessible, more kids actually choose the fruit. So there are certain things that can happen in terms of how you design things and help influence choices to make them easier choices. So I think that 
Ashley is a good example of this. Ashley lives in South London, and when he was 11 years old, he, um, he was overweight by his own admission. He said, oh, I watch video, I you know, watch TV. He wasn't really into the sport very much. Well, two things happened to Ashley. One, he was lucky that he had a physical education teacher who was working with an NGO, and their um, sort of mandate or their drive was to get children in disadvantaged areas uh, more interested in sport through exposing them to sports clubs, different types of activities, introducing them to other children so that they could see what they themselves may or may not like. So he would take the swimming pools, he would take the soccer pitches, um, football pitches in, in Europe, and, um, and also basketball. So he took up basketball. Now, what I'd like to point out here is that, interestingly, he had at his disposal a, a basketball court outside of his apartment. He said he never noticed it. So he did have the design and access accessibility, but in addition to that, the choices were made easier for him because of an intervention made by his teacher at an NGO. But in terms of choice architecture, we can also look at more population-based initiatives. And uh, I love this photo. This is a, a photo of Jakarta. It's not sort of the first city you think of in terms of some of the open street initiatives that they've done. So they close off their streets, and um, periodically they have events like this where you can do physical exercise in the city. And later, um, on World Health Day itself, the Financial Times did a special uh, excerpt uh, magazine on the future of cities because of the World Health Day campaign launch, looking at cities from different angles. And one of the things they asked in one of the articles was, um, cities that are gym, why not? Why do we always think of cities as you know, cars and this or that? Why are there ways that we can design in terms of making it more physically accessible? Not just closing it off for one day, but in terms of the design itself. So a lot of times we're asked sort of, how did you go about organizing it for people who are interested in, in doing things like this, big campaigns to help promote certain initiatives, in this case, on getting people to move. We've discussed with our partners extensively about this afterwards and also within WHO. And one thing that uh, people had said was what was helpful was to have a clear vision. So we had a global target of a thousand cities where we said open up the street, but we left it flexible enough for culturally context-wise for people to do what they wanted to do and what they were already doing. So it didn't necessarily have to cost extra money, but it was a way for them to help promote their initiatives of what they were doing and have it uptake in a global movement. Critical here, I would say also, is just the WHO structure in itself. One of the key elements um, where we were able to re reach a wide audience was because of the structure of the organization. When we have campaigns like this, we have an organizing committee serves as the secretariat, and we always have a technical stream and a communication stream so that we ensure that the uh, messages are evidence-based. We have six regional offices and 143 country offices. So at each level, we're working with partners. So really, the outreach is quite wide in terms of um, how much you can reach, and in this case, getting people to move. So globally, we worked with um, various agencies, and one that I'd like to highlight, because I'll talk a little bit about that, is the 880 Cities, which is an NGO that works in terms like walk and bike for life type of initiatives. Another thing was planning. With our partners, we created something called a toolkit for event organizers. And in it, we had the key messages in terms of the technical messages we were trying to get out there, say the physical activity recommendations on a daily basis and so on. But then also actual things that cities, universities could do. So we had a huge section on um, how to go about to plan open street initiatives for those that were interested in terms of closing it off to traffic and having biking lanes and, and um, uh, walking and so on. So that was something we developed with partners in terms of the experience that cities that had already done that were doing. So we were able to use information and create them into sort of a guideline format. But we also had sections for what universities could do, um, walk to schools campaigns, that kind of thing, um, and also other activities in terms of making environments greener through uh, tree planting and so on. A wide range of initiatives to choose from. Throughout, also I would say that a broad um, element of success was reaching beyond the health sector. 
Increasingly, WHO is really trying to hit this message home. Like a lot of the health issues, I mean, especially in cities, you all know this, it's not something the health sector can solve alone. So we really need to work and reach out with, say, transport, recreation, education, police, even sanitation. So if you have these big events, what's the cleanup like afterwards? So it's really across multiple sectors and with multiple parties. So you have people, you need to have the municipality behind you, um, but also what communities themselves and NGOs can do. When you have outreach like this, um, one of the, the things that helps a lot then is that partners help disseminate your message and in a way that they are comfortable with. And a good example was we were approached by the International Olympic Committee in 2009. They said, hey, look, we've heard about this initiative. This sounds like something we could really sign on to. We have our Congress in 2009. Can you tell us a little bit more about it? And then in the end, it was President Jose Ramos Horta who, um, from East Timor who spoke about it. And for him, his passion was uh, sports and getting kids more involved in sports in cities. So he took a global initiative, made it his own, and then helped us to promote it in an international forum like this. We also had a wide range of champions. In WHO, obviously, we work across all of the regions, multiple diversity and, and so on. So here there's a picture of Governor Lagos from Nigeria, who was a big proponent of the campaign, one of the most populated cities in Africa with huge health challenges there, and talked a little bit about what he was doing and, and so on. This is our Director General, Margaret Chan, and she was talking here about the five calls to action on the launch. This is Princess Mary of um, Denmark, and um, uh, Michael Bloomberg, who's the U.S. Mayor for New York City. And he um, actually signed on and did a video testament to the Thousand Cities, Thousand Lives campaign, talking about some of the initiatives New York was taking to make the cities healthier, city healthier. From this, we also got high-profile statements of support. We were working with USAID at the time, so through those channels, for example, Hillary Clinton, who is the Secretary of State, had a, um, a profile of support for World Health Day, as did Jacques Roche, President of the National Inter uh, Olympic Committee, and various other people to help us get the message out. But really, I would say probably one of the hugest success of the campaign was the interaction um, on our um, social media site. It was the first time that WHO reached out to the general public through social media where cities could exchange information about what they were doing, upload photos, upload videos, and here you can see we had 2,200 network members, 5,500 event photos, and 180 events um, submitted. But critically what was important was that the cities could see themselves on a global map. So you would say what you were doing and then you had the global picture and you could drill down to your city level and you could visibly see that your city was registered as part of the campaign. And finally, just if people are interested in doing something like this, um, we launched the campaign early enough so that people um, would be able to have time to plan the events. So this was launched in November. And here you can see we launched it with 70 cities that had signed on. And then each day as cities registered, you could see it scroll up to 1,000 um, as World Health Day approached. The media, one of the reasons we think that the media widely covered this issue um, was because of the localization of the issue, meaning that this was something that was applicable everywhere in the world with people living in a city as it pertained to their cultural context. In WHO, if we have a global message, we often get calls from reporters saying, great, but how does this relate to my constituency? What's the data in my country? And so on. So this was one of the reasons we think it was taken up so widely, and it actually was covered on CNN on World Health Day um, in a special series. And here's the Financial Times um, special section I also mentioned. So I'm just going to sort of wrap up here a little bit about some of the results um, from this. And here you can see in the end there were 138 countries that were part of the campaign with over 1,500 cities. I'm always asked where are the countries that had the most cities to register. So this is the top 10 list. And it's, it's quite a range actually uh, of cities. And then all, with the over 5,000 photos I just uh, selected a few of the things here that people submitted online. Oops, sorry. 
Um, interestingly here in terms of partnership as well, we were approached by, um, I went to China um, to discuss with the Ministry of Health there and the National Patriotic Committee and they were doing a program already on um, health and hygiene in cities. So they wanted to use this as a way to, um, as a PR exercise really to launch that and said look we'll register all 454 cities involved in this campaign and they were doing some open street initiatives but we'd like to announce it on World Health Day itself. This is an example of when you drill down to the map here is in the states and at the city level San Francisco what they did was they have summer street uh, Sunday street initiatives and they added an additional one that they had planned around World Health Day um, so this was wide participation on that day. And just very quickly, Spain, there were 55 cities, Thailand, there were 67 cities, and Iran, which maybe some of you normally wouldn't expect to have a big uptake of this, but did. So just to wrap up here, um, I really believe that movements like this can affect public policy change. Um, from a WHO perspective, what happened uh, after this campaign was that it really did help raise awareness and urbanization and health. And one of our messages at the center, but also in WHO, is how do you take urban planning and, and scale it up to national planning? Um, so we were really lucky in the sense that because of this, through our ministries and our regional committees and so on, three of the regions took this to their governance bodies through the ministers and have now taken this to say okay urban planning should be a part of national policy and are continuing with that work so in that sense from WHO as a way forward it was a it was a big success but also for our partners to be able to leverage this opportunity to say look look what's happening around the world and look what we need to do and how we can move forward based on some of these initiatives and um, was also some of the feedback that we've gotten so I just wanted to conclude here by thanking all of the, the cities that took part. It was a great initiative overall. There's still a lot of work ahead that needs to be done. Um, and also a big thanks to our partners who helped to plan, promote, and, and participate in the actual day. And thank you all also for, for your time and attention. So thank you. Thank you Is there any question, comment? Yes, please.